Chapter 7. The Lendry and the River As Dandelion ended, Acorn, who was on the windward side of the little group, suddenly started and sat back with ears up and nostrils twitching. The strange, rank smell was stronger than ever, and after a few moments they all heard a heavy movement close by. Suddenly, on the other side of the path, the fern parted and there looked out a long, dog-like head, striped black and white. It was pointed downward, the jaws grinning, the muzzle close to the ground. Behind they could just discern great powerful paws and a shaggy black body. The eyes were peering at them, full of savage cunning. The head moved slowly, taking in the dusky lengths of the wood ride in both directions, and then fixed them once more with its fierce, terrible stare. The jaws opened wider, and they could see the teeth, glimmering white as the stripes along the head. For long moments it gazed, and the rabbits remained motionless, staring back without a sound. Then Bigwig, who was nearest to the path, turned and slipped back among the others. "'The Lendry,' he muttered as he passed through them. It may be dangerous and it may not, but I'm taking no chances with it. Let's get away. They followed him through the fern and very soon came upon another parallel path. Bigwig turned into it and broke into a run. Dandelion overtook him and the two disappeared among the ilex trees. Hazel and the others followed as best they could, with Pipkin limping and staggering behind, his fear driving him on in spite of the pain in his poor. Hazel came out on the further side of the ilexes and followed the path around a bend. Then he stopped dead and sat back on his haunches. Immediately in front of him, Bigwig and Dandelion were staring out from the sheer edge of a high bank, and below the bank ran a stream. It was in fact the little river Enborn, twelve to fifteen feet wide, and at this time of the year two or three feet deep with spring rain. But to the rabbits it seemed immense, such a river as they had never imagined. The moon had almost set and the night was now dark, but they could see the water faintly shining as it flowed, and could just make out on the further side a thin belt of nut trees and alders. Somewhere beyond, a plover called three or four times and was silent. One by one, most of the others came up, stopped at the bank and looked at the water without speaking. A chilly breeze was moving, and several of them trembled where they sat. "'Well, this is a nice surprise, Hazel.' said Bigwig at length, or were you expecting this when you took us into the wood? Hazel realised wearily that Bigwig was probably going to be troublesome. He was certainly no coward, but he was likely to remain steady only as long as he could see his way clear and be sure of what to do. To him, perplexity was worse than danger, and when he was perplexed he usually grew angry. The day before, Fiver's warning had troubled him, and he'd spoken in anger to the Threera and left the Ausler. Then, while he was in an uncertain mood about the idea of leaving the Warren, Captain Holly had appeared in capital time to be attacked, and to provide a perfect reason for their departure. Now, at the sight of the river, Bigwig's assurance was leaking again, and unless he, Hazel, could restore it in some way, they were likely to be in for trouble. He thought of the Threera and his wily courtesy. "'I don't know what we should have done without you just now, Bigwig,' he said. "'What was that animal? Would it have killed us?' "'A lendry,' said Bigwig. "'I've heard about them in the Ausler. They're not really dangerous. They can't catch a rabbit that runs, and nearly always you can smell them coming. They're funny things. I've heard of rabbits living almost on top of them and coming to no harm, but they're best avoided all the same. They'll dig out rabbit kittens, and they'll kill an injured rabbit if they find one. They're one of the thousand, all right. I ought to have guessed from the smell, but it was new to me. It had killed before it met us, said Blackbury with a shudder. I saw the blood on its lips. A rat, perhaps, or pheasant chicks. Lucky for us it had killed, otherwise it might have been quicker. Still, fortunately, we did the right thing. We really came out of it very well, said Bigwig. Fiver came limping down the path with Pipkin. They too checked and stared at the sight of the river. "'What do you think we ought to do now, Fiver? asked Hazel. Fiver looked down at the water and twitched his ears. "'We shall have to cross it,' he said. "'But I don't think I can swim, Hazel. I'm worn out. And Pipkin's a good deal worse than I am.' 
Cross it? cried Bigwig. Cross it? Who's going to cross it? What do you want to cross it for? I've never heard such nonsense. Like all wild animals, rabbits can swim if they have to, and some even swim when it suits them. Rabbits have been known to live on the edge of a wood and regularly swim a brook to feed in the fields beyond, but most rabbits avoid swimming, and certainly an exhausted rabbit could not swim the Enborn. I don't want to jump in there, said Speedwell. Why not just go along the bank? asked Hawkbit. Hazel suspected that if Fiverr felt they ought to cross the river, it might be dangerous not to, but how were the others to be persuaded? At this moment, as he was still wondering what to say to them, he suddenly realised that something had lightened his spirits. What could it be? A smell? A sound? Then he knew. Nearby, across the river, a lark had begun to twitter and climb. It was morning. A blackbird called one or two deep, slow notes and was followed by a wood pigeon. Soon they were in a grey twilight and could see that the stream bordered the further edge of the wood. On the other side lay open fields.